To Kill a Mockingbird, Chapter One. When he was nearly 13, my brother Jim got his arm badly broken at the elbow. When it healed, and Jim's fears of never being able to play football were assuaged, he was seldom self-conscious about his injury. His left arm was somewhat shorter than his right. When he stood or walked, the back of his hand was at right angles to his body, his thumb parallel to his thigh. He couldn't have cared less so long as he could pass and punt. When enough years had gone by to enable us to look back on them, we sometimes discussed the events leading to his accident. I maintain that the Ewell started it all, but Jim, who was four years my senior, said it started long before that. He said it began the summer Dill came to us. When Dill first gave us the idea of making Bo Radley come out. I said if he wanted to take a broad view of things, it really began with Andrew Jackson. If General Jackson hadn't run the creeks up the creek, Simon Finch would never have paddled up the Alabama. And where would we be if he hadn't? We were far too old to settle an argument with this fight, so we consulted Atticus. Our father said we were both right. Being Southerners, it was a source of shame to some members of the family that we had no recorded ancestors on either side of the Battle of Hastings. All we had was Simon Finch, a fur-trapping apothecary from Cornwall, whose piety was exceeded only by his stinginess. In England, Simon was irritated by the persecution of those who called themselves Methodists at the hands of their more liberal brethren. And as Simon called himself a Methodist, he worked his way across the Atlantic to Philadelphia, thence to Jamaica, thence to Mobile, and up the St. Stephens. Mindful of John Wesley's strictures on the use of many words in buying and selling, Simon made a pile practicing medicine, but in his pursuit, he was unhappy lest he be tempted into doing what he knew was not for the glory of God, as the putting on of gold and costly apparel. So Simon, having forgotten his teacher's dictum on the possession of human chattels, bought three slaves and with their aid established a homestead on the banks of the Alabama River some 40 miles above St. Stephens. He returned to St. Stephens only once to find a wife, and with her he established a line that ran high to daughters. Simon lived in an impressive age and died rich. It was customary for the men in the family to remain on Simon's homestead, Finch's Landing, and make their living from cotton. The place was self-sufficient, modest in comparison with the empires around it. The landing nevertheless produced everything required to sustain life except ice, wheat flour, and articles of clothing supplied by riverboats from Mobile. Simon would have regarded with impotent fury the disturbance between the North and the South as it left his descendants stripped of everything but their land. Yet the tradition of living on the land remained unbroken until well into the 20th century, when my father, Atticus Finch, went to Montgomery to read law, and his younger brother went to Boston to study medicine. Their sister, Alexandra, was the Finch who remained at the landing. She married a taciturn man who spent most of his time lying in a hammock by the river, wondering if his trot lines were full. When my father was admitted to the bar, he returned to Maycomb and began his practice. Maycomb was some 20 miles east of Finch's Landing, was the county seat of Maycomb County. Atticus's office in the courthouse contained little more than a hat rack, a spittoon, a checkerboard, and an unsullied code of Alabama. His first two clients were the last two persons hanged in the Macon County Jail. Atticus had urged them to accept the state's generosity in allowing them to plead guilty to second-degree murder and escape with their lives. But they were Haverfords, in Macomb County a name synonymous with jackass. 
The Haverfords had dispatched Macon's leading blacksmith in a misunderstanding arising from the alleged wrongful detention of a mayor. Were imprudent enough to do it in the presence of three witnesses and insisted that the son of a bitch had it coming to him was good enough defense for anybody. They persisted in pleading not guilty to first degree murder, so there was nothing much Atticus could do for his clients except be present at their departure, an occasion that was probably the beginning of my father's profound distaste for the practice of criminal law. During his five years in Maycomb, Atticus practiced economy more than anything. For several years thereafter, he invested his earnings in his brother's education. John Hale Finch was 10 years younger than my father and chose to study medicine at a time when cotton was not worth growing. But after getting Uncle Jack started, Atticus derived a reasonable income from the law. He liked Maycomb. He was Macon County born and bred. He knew his people, they knew him, and because of Simon Fitch's industry, Atticus was related by blood or marriage to nearly every family in the town. Maycomb was an old town, but it was a tired old town when I first knew it. In rainy weather, the streets turned to red slop. Grass grew on the sidewalks. The courthouse sagged in the square. Somehow, it was hotter then. A black dog suffered on a summer's day. A bony mule hitched to hoover carts flicked flies in the sweltering shade of the live oaks on the square. Men's stiff collars wilted by nine in the morning. Ladies bathed before noon. After their three o'clock naps, and by nightfall, were like soft tea cakes with frostings of sweat and sweet talcum. People moved slowly then. They ambled across the square, shuffled in and out of the stores around it, took their time about everything. A day was 24 hours long, but seemed longer. There was no hurry, for there was nowhere to go, nothing to buy, and no money to buy it with, nothing to see outside the boundaries of Macomb County. But it was a time of vague optimism for some of the people. Macomb County had recently been told that it had nothing to fear, but fear itself. We lived on the main residential street in town, Atticus, Jim, and I, plus Calpurnia, our cook. Jim and I found our father satisfactory. He played with us, read to us, and treated us with courteous detachment. Calpurnia was something else again. She was all angles and bones. She was nearsighted. She squinted. Her hand was wide as a bed slat and twice as hard. She was always ordering me out of the kitchen, asking me why I couldn't behave as well as Jim when she knew he was older, and calling me home when I wasn't ready to come. Our battles were epic and one-sided. Calpurnia always won, mainly because Atticus always took her side. She had been with us ever since Jim was born, and I felt her tyrannical presence as long as I could remember. Our mother died when I was two, so I never felt her absence. She was a Graham from Montgomery. Atticus met her when he was first elected to the state legislature. He was middle-aged then. She was 15 years his junior. Jim was the product of their first year of marriage. Four years later, I was born. And two years later, our mother died from a sudden heart attack. They ran in her family. I did not miss her, but I think Jim did. He remembered her clearly, and sometimes in the middle of a game, he would sigh at length, then go off and play by himself behind the car house. When he was like that, I knew better than to bother him. When I was almost six and Jim was nearly 10, our summertime boundaries, within calling distance of Calpurnia, were Mrs. Henry's Lafayette Du Bois house two doors to the north of us, and Radley Place, three doors to the south. We were never tempted to break them. The Radley Place was inhabited by an unknown entity that merely description of whom was enough to make us behave for days on end. Mrs. Dubois was plain hell. That was the summer Dill came to us. 
Early one morning, as we were beginning our day's play in the backyard, Jim and I heard something next door in Miss Rachel Haverford's collard patch. We went to the wire fence to see if there was a puppy. Miss Rachel's rat terrier was expecting. Instead, we found someone sitting looking at us. Sitting down, he wasn't much higher than the collards. We stared at him until he spoke. Hey, hey yourself, said Jim pleasantly. I'm Charles Baker Harris, he said. I can read. So what, I said. I just thought you'd like to know I can read. You got anything needs reading? I can do it. How old are you, asked Jim. Four and a half? Going on seven. Shoot, no wonder then, said Jim, jerking his thumb at me. Scout yonder's been reading ever since she was born, and she ain't even started to school yet. You look right puny for going on seven. I'm little, but I'm old, he said. Jim brushed his hair back to get a better look. Why don't you come over, Charles Baker Harris, he said. Lord, what a name. It's not any funnier than yours. Aunt Rachel says your name's Jeremy Atticus Finch. Jim scowled. I'm big enough to fit mine, he said. Your name's longer than you are. Bet it's a foot longer. Folks call me Dill, said Dill, struggling under the fence. Do better if you go over it instead of under it, I said. Where'd you come from? Dill was from Meridian, Mississippi, was spending the summer with his aunt, Miss Rachel, and would be spending every summer in Maycomb from now on. His family was from Macomb County originally. His mother worked for a photographer in Meridian, had entered his picture in a beautiful child contest, and won $5. She gave the money to Dill, who went to the picture show 20 times on it. Don't have any picture shows here except Jesus ones in the courthouse sometimes, said Jim. Ever see anything good? Dill had seen Dracula, a revelation that moved Jim to eye him with the beginning of respect. Tell it to us, he said. Dill was a curiosity. He wore blue linen shorts that buttoned to his shirt. His hair was snow white and stuck to his head like duck fluff. He was a year my senior, but I towered over him. As he told us the old tale, his blue eyes would lighten and darken. His laugh was sudden and happy. He habitually pulled at a cowlick in the center of his forehead. When Dill reduced Dracula to dust and Jim said the show sounded better than the book, I asked Dill where his father was. You ain't said anything about him. I haven't got one. Is he dead? No. Then if he's not dead, you've got one, haven't you? Dill blushed and Jim told me to hush, a sure sign that Dill had been studied and found acceptable. Thereafter, the summer passed in routine contentment. Routine contentment was improving our treehouse that rested between giant twin chinaberry trees in the backyard, fussing, rushing through our list of dramas based on the works of Oliver Optic, Victor Appleton, and Edgar Rice Burroughs. In this matter, we were lucky to have Dill. He played the character parts formally thrust upon me. The ape in Tarzan, Mr. Crabtree in The Rover Boys, Mr. Damon in Tom Swift. Thus, we came to know Dill as a pocket Merlin, whose head teemed with eccentric plans, strange longings, and quaint fantasies. And we'll pause here, and we'll continue with chapter one in the next video. I hope you're enjoying the story. Please like, subscribe, and leave a comment below. I'd love to hear from you. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.